Father, we come before you today, and we just thank you, Lord, for your word, that it doesn't return void, but it always accomplishes what it's sent forth to accomplish. God, we open our hearts today, and we ask that you'd speak to us, bring comprehension today to what you're saying to your church. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. And last week, I started a message called, Do You Know Your Value? And that was part one. This is part two of that same message. Do you know your value? And I think as humans, we don't really understand how valuable we are to God. And I want to look at a few scriptures today. Maybe, hopefully, we'll see with new eyes today the value that God places in us. And so in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 39, it says, Jesus replied, this was... What happened was the Sadducees were questioning. They were a religious sect. They were questioning Jesus. Jesus um, was too smart for them. And then the Pharisees says, well, hey, why don't we ask a question? One of the lawyers stood up, and he asked this question to Jesus. What is the greatest of all commandments? And this is what Jesus said to him because they were trying to trip him up. He said, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord, your God, with some of your heart. Oh, yeah, sorry. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Um, And second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. And so when I hear this scripture being preached many times in the past, you always hear a lot of reference to the fact that we got to love the Lord, we have to love our neighbor, but we don't hear much about loving ourselves. And I want to say today that if we don't love ourselves, we can't love others. And so the enemy wants us, even from the Garden of Eden, he wanted Eve and Adam to think that God didn't value them and that he was holding back from them. And he said, you know, has God not said? You know, God's trying to hold back because if, if you, he knows that if you knew, uh, if you ate of the tree, then you were going to know stuff that only he knows, that only we know, and, and he's holding out because he, he's holding back. But God valued Adam and Eve, and he values us. And so the first commandment, say with me, is to love the Lord with my whole being. That's the first commandment. And it's interesting that it says that we have to love the Lord with our mind as well. You know, Christianity is not just a blind faith. It's actually, it's intellectual. I mean, you can read the Bible and you can study the Word of God, and there's a science to this stuff. I mean, God's Word is, it makes sense. And, and, and it, so it's not just a blind faith. It, it makes a lot of sense. You need to be willing to, to put aside some of your old philosophies of life and look at the philosophy of God, and it, there's a lot of wisdom there. But here, when God is speaking, Jesus is speaking here, he's talking about loving the Lord. There's five words in the Greek for love. I know I did a sermon series on this in the past. The first one, or not the first one, the first one I'm going to mention to keep you awake is eros. Eros is actually the word... We get our English word erotic from. Erotic love is actually a passionate sexual love designed for marriage and is designed to be within that relationship. And we understand that. Then the second one is filio, which is a brotherly love, a friendship type of love. The third is agape. And the agape love is the love of God. The agape love is actually a parental, mature, sacrificial type of love. And so many of you guys, if you're parents, you understand that type of love because you have children. You know that you're willing to sacrifice your life. You're willing to sacrifice some of your paycheck, or most of it actually, to put your kids through college, right? Why? Because it's a sacrificial love. And most parents, if they're emotionally healthy, will, would agree that they love their children more than they love themselves. There's, there's an ability to sacrifice. If you see your kids running out on the street and a car is coming, I don't think there's any parent here that wouldn't run out, push the kid, and take the car for the kid. How many know what I'm talking about? I don't think there's a parent here, if their kid was suffering with a terminal illness, wouldn't say, I'll take, I'd take that for you so that you wouldn't have to suffer. How many would agree? That is a sacrificial love. So if you want to understand what the God kind of love is, it's imparted into us as parents. If you're a parent, you understand how you love your children. It doesn't mean that you don't discipline your children. 
It doesn't mean you're not getting angry with your children. Son, do I ever get angry with you? See? But I love him. It doesn't mean that God can't get angry. It doesn't mean that God won't discipline us. It doesn't mean that God is not going to allow us to go through certain things to build character. Why? Because that's true agape love. It's parental. It's sacrificial. It's willing to lay yourself down in order to raise another up. That's agape love. And then there's storge love, which speaks of the love for the community, love for country, you know, patriotic. It's a cultural type of love. Guess what kind of love we're talking about in this verse? When the Bible, when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, that word is agape. It's talking about the God kind of love, to have that sacrificial love for God, to have that sacrificial love for your neighbor. So the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with your whole being. The second is equally important, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? How many want to do that today? And so this is the whole principle of being a Christ follower, of being a Christian, is that we, we want to, to, to receive the love of God and give it away. And if there's a blockage there, if you don't know God's love, you can't effectively give it away. And actually, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 11, I'm going to read it here. This is John the Apostle, and he's speaking. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Love is of God. See, see, love, every, see, every time you have loved, whether in any, those four words I talked about, that kind of love that comes out of you, that has come from the Father. If God didn't exist, there wouldn't be love. Love comes from God, and everyone who loves is born of God, and knows God. And of course, this word love is the word agape. Verse 8. He who does not love does not know God. Okay? For God is love. So God doesn't just give love or produce love. He is love. And so when we were created in the image of God, that, that we were created in his likeness, that means there's a deposit of God's unconditional sacrificial love that's been deposited in us. So every time you love a child, every time you love sacrificially, that's the nature of God. Whether you're born again or not, that's the nature of God coming through you because you were born in his image. Does this make sense? And so let's keep reading here. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that he might live through him. And here's the, here's the thing. If you're going for a dinner date, you're going to meet someone for a meeting. Okay, I was listening to a preacher this week and he was talking about this. Um, and they're willing to meet you halfway. So, okay, we're going to meet halfway across the city. They live in another city. We'll meet halfway. Well, that's, that's an honorable thing, isn't it? You know, you, you're showing that you're valuable. We're not, you're not going to have to come all the way to my city. We'll meet halfway. That's, that's a good thing. But Jesus came all the way. God said, you're so valuable. I'm going to set up a meeting, and I'm going to come all the way. And he came all the way into Bethlehem and landed in a manger. And he didn't just spend a few minutes here on earth to say, okay, I want to kind of figure out what it is to be an earthling. No, he stayed for 33 years and was tempted in every way just as we are tempted. He knows what it's like to be rejected, doesn't he? He had his, his closest disciple reject him three times. He had his, his, his other disciples ran and left him in his time of need. His parents, there was a time when his family said, Jesus, you're a little cuckoo, and they, they deserted him. He healed people that turned on him. He knows what it's like to have people turn on him. He understands exactly what we've gone through, yet he still has, he, he has the ability to say here, listen, he's writing this, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. What Jesus was saying, though, though people reject me, though people want to kill me and put me on a cross, I love myself because the Father loves me. And if Jesus is able to say it, how much more can we look at our lives and say, though so, someone rejected me, though a parent let me go and put me in an orphanage, though a boss has ripped me up and made me feel like a piece of dirt, 
I love myself because God says I'm okay. Because if you let the things of life and the discouragements and the rejections and the abuses press you down, you have nothing to give to another unless you're fulfilled in his love. And so here's verse 10. In this is love. In this is agape. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. We didn't love him. Before, we weren't thinking about him. And those people that were living on the earth, you know, you know, when Jesus was on the earth, they didn't love him. They weren't looking for him. They were looking for a Messiah that could set up a kingdom so they could have more power than the Romans. They weren't looking for a Messiah. But Jesus, while we were yet sinners, God said, they're so valuable to me, I want to get into their lives. I want to save them. He loved us. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that's what he did. And so what's really cool here in verse 10? Let's, let's read verse 10 together, okay? In this is love. Let's together. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, okay? Now, the Bible says that he, sorry, I missed the verse here. Uh, we love God. That we, we're somewhere here. Ah, verse 11. That's where it is. Verse 11. Let's read verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us. Now, I want you to look at this word here. Because it would be enough to say, beloved, if God loved us, we also ought to love one another. But he, there's always this word so. And I like to read it this way. Beloved, if God so loved us, see, we don't understand that. See, it's not that God just loved us, it's that he so loved us, right? For God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son, John 3, 16. No, for God so loved us. Every time the Bible talks about God's love, it's not just God loves, it's God so loves Kind of like you look at your children. You look at someone else's, your nephews, okay, uh, and your nieces, and you say, I love them. But you look at your kids and you go, I so love them. Isn't that beautiful? And we bypass that because sometimes we read too quick, right? But God so loves us. The level that we love ourselves is the level that we love others. And so what I want to do here, can everybody see this board here? I'll put it up here. Okay, here we go. There we go. All right. So I'm going to draw a line down the center here. And we need to recognize, first of all, that we're in his image, okay? Can you guys read that? He's created us in his image. Male and female were created in his, Im in his image. If you don't like yourself, it's like you don't like God because he made you. We've got to get this today, okay? We're made in his image. The second thing is we're forgiven. We're made in his image. Honey, can I get you to write this? Come write this. Just write the word forgiven for me. You write, I'll preach. We're forgiven. Past, present, and future. He died on the cross once and for all for the sins of all mankind. He died for the sin you're going to commit tomorrow. He died for the sin you're going to commit a year from now. So you've got to keep your heart pure. And when you sin and when you transgress, you come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy in time and need. You have been forgiven. Why? Because you're valuable. The most precious thing in the universe, the blood of Jesus Christ, was shed. The most valuable currency so that you can be saved because God so loved you. If we could get that. The next one is we'll put down is we're precious. We're precious, which makes us valuable. So you can put those two words, precious and valuable. Precious and valuable. We don't always feel that way, do we? I remember when I was about 15, I told my cousin, I said, I'm going to get a vet, a Corvette. 
Of course, when you're 15, you don't have the money for a Corvette. So we're in, we're in this competition to see who would get a sports car first. So I got a vet when I was 16. Actually, I was about 17. I got a vet. It was a Chevette, yes. <laughs> so we'll bring, up, we'll bring up the picture. Just come in here, and I'll show you my Chevette here. And I called him up and said, hey, man, I said, I got, I got this vet. And you could tell, I could hear his, on the other side of the phone, he was kind of like, oh, man, he beat me, right? I got this vet, and I said, I'm going to come down and visit you. So I pull up in a Chevette that I paid 150 bucks for. <laughs> you got the picture there, brother? We'll bring it up. There we go. Now, that, that wasn't my car. Mine was white, and it, looked, it was more rusty. But <laughs> this is a Chevette. Beautiful car, right? Um, I'll give you some specs. 65 horsepower, 0 to 16, or sorry, 0 to, <laughs> zero to 60 in 14.4 seconds, and uh, the value was 150 bucks. So that was my, my car, and so I showed up, and he was just like, he, he laughed, and he was, oh, I thought you got a, I said, I, I didn't lie, I said I got a vet, but it was a Chevette, not a Corvette. And so um, it, it didn't have a lot of value, right? So let's look, let's look at the, the next car. This is a car my cousin got. Go to the next slide there. There should be a second slide on there. Yeah. Hit next. What's that? Go again. Okay, maybe it's not on there. I thought it was on there. Oh, you're not, you're not in the PowerPoint. You're on a picture. Go, go in the PowerPoint. Anyway, I'll, I'll, you try to find it, and I'll talk about it here. Okay, so the kind of car he got was he got a Mercedes S63. Uh, is is a beautiful car. That's uh, 577 horsepower compared to my 65 horsepower. Okay, zero to 60 in 3.8 seconds, and it's valued at $168,000 plus. And I asked him, because he's a businessman, I said, how do you get the money to buy cars? Like, how do you succeed? How do you make money like this? He goes, you tithe. Interesting. Anyway, I wanted some. I wanted some like strategy, but he threw that at me. But the point is, uh, maybe I don't have it. But you guys know what a Mercedes is. It's a beautiful, beautiful car, and this was a top end, gorgeous car. And when I went in it with him, my I was scared because it was so fast. It buckles you to the seat and whatnot, right? Um, so I want to say that. There we go. Bring it up. There we go. You get an idea. Anyway, nice car. Okay, so the next thing is, so we're made in his image, we've fallen, we have sin in our life, so we need to be forgiven. Once we're forgiven, uh, we, we're very precious to God, and we're very valuable, which in turn, this is the next thing here, is he sets a high standard for us, a high standard. I don't want to explain this to you, because my Chevette, I could drive into Detroit, and I could leave the car on the side of the road with the keys in the ignition and the window down, and nobody would steal my rims. <laughs> nobody would touch the car. It'd probably be left there, okay? That, because it didn't have much value. But his car, you know, his car, you do not leave it in Detroit because it will disappear. The rims, everything will disappear. It'll get scratched. If, you know, he would be very careful where he parked. Because if you park in the wrong place, like he'd park at the back of the grocery store, the farthest parking spot, because all the people that park in the front row to the grocery store are the cars with all the dents. I know from experience. I got dents all over my car because we're always looking for the closest parking spot. So, you know, there's value in your car, so you park far away. I would take my Chevette, and I remember one year, and I don't know, those things were invincible. I went down to Sobble Beach, and uh, I would drive on the sand. And, you know, you, you could hook people up and they would surf behind your car, whatever. You're going down the sand. And I remember changing the oil. I came back from Sobble Beach and maybe, you know, four months later or something, I changed the oil. And out of the oil came clumps of sand. And it, I don't know how it didn't ruin the seals. I just, those cars were built like tanks, right? And the car still ran really good. And it was all rusted up. And then I, then I painted it up. I covered, did some cheap, cheap body work, covered the rust, painted it, and sold it to someone for 150 bucks. a friend of mine, who I went to visit two weeks later and noticed that most of the filling had fallen off and the rust had come through. And I pulled up, and I said, I'm leaving, and I left. 
Never seen him again because he was upset. But the point is, the car didn't have much value. I could go down roads that were rough. I could drive on the beach. I could do all. Because if you don't have much value, there's no standard. But my cousin's car, you know, you don't, you got to be careful what roads you drive on. Because if you go where there's a speed bump, you're going to lose the bottom of your car. And the reason why I say that is once you recognize that you're forgiven, that you're precious and you're very, very valuable, the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's a very precious thing. So there's certain roads you're not going to go down. There's certain things you're not going to do. There's certain places you're not going to hang out. Why? Because you're of great value. And so your life has to change. And it changes not because you feel like, oh, God's trying to hold out and I can't have fun. No, you, you, you don't go certain places. You don't hang out with certain people. You don't do the same things you used to do because you're valuable and you don't want to defile. You don't want to damage your vehicle. Does that make sense? And that's it. And that's what happened when I radically got saved. It was like, I, I can't swear anymore. I can't hang out in these places. You can't get drunk. You can't do things. like You just can't do it anymore. Why? Because you realize you're so valuable that all of that lifestyle no longer, it, you're not interested because it'll bring damage to who you are because you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen? But if you think in your mind that you're a Chevette, that God saved you, but you're still the same person you used to be, that he didn't actually do what he said he said he did, was that he took you and seated you in heavenly places with Christ. You're a joint heir with Christ. If you still think you're a Chevette, you'll go down the rough roads. You'll let your car get nicked. You'll let people eat in your car and leave a mess all over the place, like my kids do. <laughs> I got so much food stuck in the tracks, I can't even fold my chairs down anymore. There's no coffee in my car. <laughs> so the next thing is that he, he loves. He loves me. Write that there. He loves. And the last one is he believes. No, right down here. He believes. And so we'll go through these here. And so we're made in his image. Thank you, honey. We're forgiven. We're precious to God because we're valuable. And because we're valuable, we have a high standard of holiness. The Bible says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. There's a coming out. You're no longer, you're no longer a Chevette. You're now a Mercedes. You're, you're, you're valuable. You're precious to God. So there's going to be a standard that God's going to hold you to because now you're royalty. You're going to act differently. Then you, you recognize that he loves you and that he believes in you. You know that God believes in you? God believes in you so much that he's kind of made this balcony in heaven. I don't know what it looks like. The Bible says there's a great cloud of witnesses that are hanging over and they're cheering you on. They say, run your race. Right? He's, they know how, heaven knows how valuable, how, how valuable you are. Heaven knows that, that God loves you so much that he gave everything for you. God and heaven, they believe in you. You're going you're gonna to go the distance. You're going to run your race. You're going to win the prize. But, but we stand in the mirror. And if this was a mirror, we look at it, and we say, uh, I don't believe God loves me. I, I don't really feel precious today. But you know what? It doesn't matter how you feel. It's what God's word says that's real, right? And so God wants us to walk in a different place. And so what God does is because God is so in love and so merciful that, that if you need compassion, this is what God does. See, God, God baptizes us, and he pours out compassion. So, you know, oh, I'm going through a hard time. Maybe, maybe you know, you lost a loved one or something. I don't know what it is, but it can be a traumatic event. Something happens, and you just need compassion. You need, and God says, oh, you need compassion? Here, and he takes a bucket full of compassion, and there you go. Oh, you need mercy today? Oh, my mercy? Oh, it's new every morning. Here, take some. You need some tomorrow? Here's some mercy. You need forgiveness? Oh, come boldly into the throne room. Receive your forgiveness. It's free. Here it is. Take it. And God's just loading on forgiveness. God is just loading on mercy. How many times have you messed up and God hasn't left you? Because he's love. And he takes his bucket and he says, here you go, take it. Take. And he's pouring, he's baptizing you with mercy. He's baptizing you with forgiveness. He's baptizing you with grace. Every time I need it, my God's got bucketfuls. 
And this is what happens. Is um, someone needs compassion for me or you. And this is, this has happened. Oh, you need compassion? Okay, I got, I got a little bit to spare here. Okay, here you go. There's a little bit of compassion. There you go. You need mercy? Okay, I, I, I got a little bit here. Let me just, uh, thank you, Father. I'll do a little bit there. There's a little bit of mercy here. Not too much, you know, you can't handle too much. I want to make sure you're totally repentant, you know. I, you know. Oh, you need forgiveness. Forgiveness, okay. Hold on a second here. This is more like it. Here we go. Here you go. Here's some forgiveness. But first of all, I want to fast about it. I'm going to fast for a week from midnight to 7 a.m. all week. And I got to talk to my pastor, my small group leader. I want to make sure that, you know, that I'm doing the right thing. And then, then I'll give you, well, here, I'll just, I'm a Christian, so I'll give you forgiveness. Come on. And, and here's, here's the issue. The problem with the capful Christian is there's a comprehension deficiency. Because whether you realize or not, God has forgiven. Whether you realize it or not, God has loved. Whether you real, realize it or not, you are valuable. Why do you think God hates abortion? Because people are valuable. That's why God hates it. He's willing to forgive if we've done it, if we come and ask forgiveness. But he values life. All life. And so, he loves us first. We then love him because we receive this agape love. We, we love him because we recognize how unconditionally he values us. And then we're able to pour out into others. It's so important. It's a comprehension issue. And this is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. We'll bring that up. Paul is praying for the church of Ephesus. He says, this is his prayer. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend, say comprehend, with all the saints, what is the width, what is the length, what is the depth, and what is the height. Now, I have a professor friend who is at Queen's University in Kingston. I asked him, can you figure this out, the scripture, because it seems like it's four dimensions and we only live in a three-dimensional world. He says, I cannot. He tried to figure out what Paul was trying to say. He said, there's just a dimension of God that we don't even understand in the natural. It's, his love is not three-dimensional. It's four-dimensional. It's deep. And, and then he says, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, in other words, I can't even explain it, you got to experience it, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Isn't that awesome? Would you mind if we take just a couple minutes and break this verse down? You okay, Steve? You're the only one? Anybody else? Can we break it down? Okay. It says here, number one, that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith. How does faith come? It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need faith to believe that what God said about you and I is true, okay? So here's an idea that we can try out, okay? Try agreeing with what the word of God says. So when you stand in front of the mirror, you say, okay, you know what? God says, I'm made in his image. So instead of me saying, I'm, I, you know, I'm no good, I'm going to say, I'm going to agree that I'm made in his image, okay? I'm going to agree with God. And just like, you know, uh, Bianca said this morning, you know, she didn't feel like it. Who cares about how I feel? My, feels, my feelings will have to catch up. But I'm going to agree with what he has to say about me. I'm going to believe he says I'm forgiven, okay? He says I'm forgiven. So here's the key. Because he says I'm forgiven then I'm going to forgive myself. Because how many of us at times say, you know, I know God forgives me, but I have a hard time forgiving myself. Right? Well, what does God say? God says you're forgiven. So you say, you know what, God, I don't feel like it, but because you say I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. And I'm going to receive that forgiveness. And you know what happens when that happens? We'll get to that in a few minutes. The next one is, God says you're precious and you're valuable. I'm just going to put precious here. Because God says I'm precious, even though I 
Even though my boss has things to say about me, even though my family has never said I was precious, I'm going to believe what God says. God says I'm precious, I'm valuable, I'm the temple of God. He came to die for me. So I don't care what anybody else says, I'm precious. Now, now I'll say this. Your feelings might be saying I don't feel that way. But you start by confessing what God says. Your feelings will catch up. I promise. So I'm precious. I'm valuable. And then what you do is you say, you know what? Because I'm precious, I'm valuable, I'm forgiven, I don't really want to do the things I used to do because I'm valuable to God. I recognize I'm valuable. So you set a high standard for your life. Okay? And then you start to declare that he loves he loves you, and then the last one is he believes. And so you begin to pray, and you begin to believe the word of God and declare it over yourself, and you look in the mirror and you say, God, if you've forgiven me, I forgive me. If you say I'm precious, that means I'm precious. That doesn't mean you go around and you're cocky and you say, yeah, I'm, I'm the temple of God, and God loves me, and all. You don't do that, but you know it deep inside. And what you do is you appropriate by faith. Say appropriate by faith. The bucket. And you begin to experience the bucket by faith because you're beginning to declare what God says about you is the truth. Instead of saying, I'm a worm, I'm no good, I can't achieve anything. No, you start saying, no, I believe what God says. I want to see from heaven's perspective. If God says I'm awesome, then I'm awesome, and there's nothing to say about it. And then what happens is you begin to experience the bucket. So when someone comes to you and says, you know what? I know when 10 years ago I stole your boyfriend from you. I yelled at you or I said this about you. Will you and they didn't, can't even get the words out. Will you forgive me? You're like, yeah, hey, hold on. I got a bucket. Take it. You know, Phew. I've experienced it. And I want you to experience it. Let's sit down. Let's talk about the grace of God. Did you know that we've all sinned and fall short? You know, I, I've, without Christ, I'm a mess up, but he has filled me. He loves me. He's valuable. He says I'm valuable. So you know what? You're valuable. And I hear, take it. There's no more capful Christianity. You begin to show mercy at a level, and you begin to show forgiveness at a level that is unparalleled. Why? Because you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, you can't love others. Because the Bible says, freely you've received, freely give. If you've not appropriated by faith God's love for you and let it come in by confessing what God says, you have nothing to pour out. Amen? I want to end with this... Um, John chapter 8, verse 1 to 11. I'm just going to read it because I love this story. Jesus re returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he went back again to the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Now, she was probably very humiliated because if you were caught in the act, that's pretty humiliating. They put her in front of the crowd and said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down, wrote on the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and began to write in the dust. What he was writing, nobody knows. Some people says maybe he was writing the sins of those who were watching. Maybe he was writing their names. Who knows? But whatever he was doing, Holy Ghost was on duty that day because they were all convicted, and they were just, they didn't know what to do. So... He stoked down again, rode in the dust. Then when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Did, didn't even one of them condemn you? And she said, No, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I go and sin no more. And here's, here's, here's the key of all this. Jesus basically with his actions said, you're very valuable to me. You're very valuable. And I'm going to show you mercy instead of judgment. And because you're valuable and because I'm showing you mercy that you've probably never seen from another man, I'm asking you one thing. Because you're valuable, go and defile your temple no more. Amen? Holiness is always tied into the love of God.
It really is. And so this morning as I close, why don't we stand in prayer and we're just going to pray a simple prayer. If you want in on this prayer, just lift your hand right now for a moment here. and Just to make a sign before the Lord that, hey, I want to do business today with you, Father. And just pray this. You can put your hand down. Just pray with me all over this place. Say, Heavenly Father, help me to see myself from your perspective. Just as Paul prayed, may my comprehension be opened to the bucket full of grace and forgiveness and love that has been poured over my life continually. And I will in turn pour out to others the same measure to the best of my ability that you've poured into me. In Jesus' name.